good luck trying to shut off your mind. People often come to the practice of meditation thinking that they're going to be able to shut off their minds. Uh, it's perhaps not very therapeutic, but the appropriate response is often good luck. Good luck trying to shut off your mind because we're narrative beings. We've got stories about the past. We've got stories about the future. And while we are engaging here in our conversation, our minds are preoccupied with us. Things. We call it monkey mind, and uh, it's this funny thing about we're like our minds are so busy, they're all over the place, like a bunch of monkeys running through from tree to tree in the jungle. But you know, the, our distant relatives share something in common. Chatter, chatter, chatter. So our meditation practice doesn't shut the mind but it does turn the volume down. It's like going to the mental gym. So you want to do it for more than a couple minutes a week. Think about going to the gym. Well, I'm just going to lift weights for a couple minutes and maybe I'll come back later in the week. Well, good luck getting stronger. Um, same thing with our meditation practice. The more we practice, the better we get at it. And we still hear it. I said, oh, mindfulness, it's just a buzzword. Well, go ahead, try it. Try a little meditation and see what happens. We're all a work in progress. We really are. And, uh, and we're teachable and, until our last breath. Welcome back, everyone, for another episode of American Real. This week, we have a treat for you as I sit down with mindfulness-based programs teacher, Rachel Leonard. I had lots of questions for Rachel as she covered topics such as anxiety and where emotions show up in our body. She demonstrates the importance of naming the emotion and by doing so, how it changes our relationship with that emotion. Then we engaged in a deep conversation about the constant chatter in our minds, which she refers to as the monkey mind, and how that affects our awareness. Rachel provides some excellent tools with how to deal with distractions, as well as the best way to approach people who may be distracted during a phone conversation or a face-to-face -face meeting. Finally, our guest provides a wealth of knowledge about mindfulness and insights regarding a scientific explanation of the neural mechanisms associated with meditation practice. You may want to have a notepad handy to capture the name of books she recommends and gives other great tools that you may be interested in researching. So sit back and relax as I welcome Rachel Leonard. This is American Real. I am Roger Brooks. My guest today is Rachel Leonard a social worker with a background in nursing and mindfulness-based counseling. 
You have trained extensively at the Center for Mindfulness at the University of Massachusetts Medical School, um, along with other institutions in Philadelphia and Rochester, New York. In the broader community, you teach various mindfulness-based programs and offer individual mindfulness-based counseling. Rachel, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. It's a treat to be here. So I think it's important uh, sometimes to talk about how people come together. And our show is about real stories of real people and real conversations. And I think it's also important to let people know sometimes how the two people connect for an interview. And it's no secret that you are the mom or mother of our producer, Michael Leonard. I am. <laughs> and we had met on occasion uh, at different events, and we've talked about your work. And every time I met with you, I felt we have to have her on the show. And I'm so glad it, we, it all came together today. Me too. <laughs> Me too. So mindfulness is one of those topics that I think is becoming more and more known. Uh, it's being talked about even in the workplace. I know at, at my workplace we talk about it. And i um, really excited to have this conversation today because I don't know if a lot of people are exposed to it in a professional way. You do this for a living. And I know we're going to go through a lot today to hopefully um, talk about some examples and teach people some different skills or at least be aware of, of different things that, that can help us from a, from a mind standpoint. Absolutely. It's more than a mind standpoint, Roger, because what we know is that the mind and the body and the emotions are all interconnected. So mindfulness is not just about the mind. It's about present moment uh, John Kabat-Zinn, who started the Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction Program at University of Massachusetts Medical Center back in the late 70s, describes mindfulness as being intentionally present in the moment, aware, intentionally, with an attitude of non-judging. And that last piece is a tough one because we're often judging ourselves. But as we practice mindfulness, and we often use uh, mindfulness and meditation interchangeably. So I may actually use them interchangeably as we talk here. Um, but we're bringing our attention very purposefully to the present moment. Noticing not just what we're thinking, but we're noticing emotions. We are noticing what's arising in the body. And noticing, for example, let's take a good one today might be anxiety. A lot of people feel anxious. And they can name, oh, I really feel anxious. But when we ask, where does that show up in your body? Oftentimes, folks will say, I don't know, I never thought about it. So mindfulness is awareness of where those emotions show up in the body. Interestingly, all of our, our emotions resonate somewhere in the body. For example, I might ask you, if I may, think of um, a recent strong emotion. And can you name it? Sadness. Sadness. Where does that sadness resonate in your body? Where do you feel it? Here. Yeah. Yeah. By naming it, you're bringing, you're actually doing something in your brain, which is very good for you. We can talk about that in a moment. But you are holding that emotion with a bit of compassion. So we drop the judging, paying attention in the present moment, on purpose and non-judgmentally. So we're naming it and maybe holding it with compassion. And interestingly, when we do that, it changes our relationship hmm. to the emotion. 
and we're able to work with it. So when you talk about being present and having awareness, so as you're talking about that, I'm thinking, should I be thinking or should I just be focused on, and this, I, I guess in any conversation, that's what I struggle with is when you're aware, can you be aware with the person you're speaking with and think, or should you just be 100% focused on what they're saying? What a great question, Roger. <laughs> People often come to the practice of meditation thinking that they're going to be sh able to shut off their minds. Uh, it's perhaps not very therapeutic, but the appropriate response is often good luck. Good luck trying to shut off your mind because we're narrative beings. We humans, for as long as we humans have been on the planet, are narrative beings. We've got stories. We've got stories about the past. We've got stories about the future. And while we are engaging here in our conversation, our minds are preoccupied with other things. But using the breath, what a great tool. And we can do this anywhere because we're always breathing. So we, are, we become aware of the thoughts. Breathe, come back to the present moment. So it's normal, and perhaps this may make you feel a little bit better, Roger, about those stories going on in your head, because this is normal. We humans are narrative beings. So we've got, uh, and as the interview is happening here, what's the next thing we need to move to is a normal question for you to be asking. No, and I'm, I'm really glad you just mentioned that, because as part of what I do, and others that interview people, is you have to be thinking ahead, but you also have to remain present. So I, you know, I'm trying to develop the skill of listening to give a person a platform to be able to speak, but also know what's coming so the conversation flows naturally. Right, right. Fun little practice, we call it dipping. So as we're talking, we can, each one of us, silently dip in to ourselves and notice. We're just noticing what's arising in the thoughts, the body, and the emotions. And we can do this while we're chatting here. And we can say, oh, okay, and stay on the mark with what we're doing. But now all we've done is gotten ourselves re-centered, re-centered in that very essence of who we are, which, and it may surprise you, that center of ourselves as humans is actually a place of calm. There's an interesting book written by a psychotherapist called Hardwired for Happiness. Mm. And we often don't realize that we are literally hardwired, and this gets into our neurophysiology again, we're actually hardwired for happiness. Um, what a relief to know that. Yes. Because as we take that one mindful breath, we can get regrounded, recentered, right in the middle of what's happening in our lives. So I have a question related to our last topic here, and that is, so I think people, I, I struggle with it, I know, and I'm trying to get better at it, and I know a lot of people struggle with this. So we talk, you've talked about being present and the importance of being present. How does one handle if you're on the phone with someone or in a meeting or out to lunch and the person is on their phone? or they're distracted and you're on the phone and you could hear them typing. They're, they're not really listening. Mm -hmm. Another wonderful book um, on communication, Crucial Conversations. I think it's a must read for everybody. Anybody who communicates with other humans should read Crucial Conversations okay. because it 
does step-by-step guidance in how to have these difficult conversations. And mindful communication is a topic unto itself. Yes. Um, And so we'll often use I statements rather than saying, you're typing, I can hear it. And that makes me think, and here's the narrative that's going on. It automatically pops up. And I, I know you're not listening to me fully because you're typing. Um, should I call you back later? So in this moment, it might be good for you to dip in and notice where whatever emotion is popping up because there's an emotion associated with this. So noticing that emotion, where it's resonating in your body, and then breathe, one breath. And what if you're dealing with someone, especially in a workplace, as a superior, and the superior is known to do that or constantly does that to you and others. Is there a way to have that conversation where there's not a lot of friction? You bet. Start with heart is one of the steps that they talk about in crucial conversations. Also using I statements rather than you, because it's very accusatory sort of, posturing, verbal posturing, and of course the body language comes along with it. Um, So when when things go like this between us, in like this conversation, I feel, and then just state how you feel. Um, I understand that you have something important to say to me. And I respect that. The way we're conversing right now, how I feel is not being effective for me. So you keep it in the arena of yourself. I feel this. And you drop any kind of accusations. So I don't feel as if we're connecting well right now. Would it work for you if, I, uh, if we pick up this conversation in a few minutes? Or, uh, no, and everyone that's listening to this, that's really good information because I know for a fact that a lot of people go through this every single day and they don't know how to handle it. So yes. those tools and tips that you just gave are little, as I call, golden nuggets. So uh, appreciate that. And, and I, I, I will post... Uh, a link to the book that you, or the, both of the books that you recommended. I'm sure we'll talk about others as well. Um, another, another thought in these uh, crucial conversations is taking a moment for yourself um, to honor whatever's coming up for yourself in the midst of a challenging conversation and then also honoring where that person is coming from. And that's a tough one for a lot of us because truly Mm. we bring all of our stuff with us. When we come into a conversation, say a a supervisor comes in and it's the start of the day. And for some reason that is not known to you, they seem angry. And we have no idea what the person has been through before they walk. Mm. Door. All we know is that right now they appear angry or, or anxious or whatever. Um, and so honoring their experience and, and saying, okay, that's, but not taking it on ourselves. Right. And maybe, you know, maybe something uh, very frustrating happened in the morning. And for whatever reason, that individual has not let go of it. So they come in, and since they can't kick the dog, they come in and verbally kick you. And so saying, that's their stuff. And again, that, a non-judgment, right? Right, right. And honoring all that, this, all that this person brings. Not that we have to take ownership of any piece of it. Um, as a friend of mine often says, 
My responsibility is to keep my side of the street clean. Mm -hmm. Simply to say, I'm not responsible for other people's emotions or actions. I've got enough on my plate just managing mine. Mm -hmm. So it's really in that connection with that person who comes into the room, you are in the moment able to say, okay, this is this person's experience and my own I'm breathing, I'm checking in with myself, I'm touching into that calm center that is mine. And out of that calm center, I'm gonna be able to respond to this person in a way that's going to facilitate this exchange. And then I'm not gonna take responsibility for anything other than my piece of it. Mm. Great. So you talked about mindfulness, meditation, uh, you touched on them a little bit, what they are. Now let's talk about what they're not. Okay. Meditation. I can't do that is what I often hear. Uh, I can't just sit there and, uh, and, and do nothing. And that's kind of a joke in the, in the mindfulness teaching crowd because we invite people to, instead of saying, don't just sit there, do something. We turn it around and we say, don't just do something, sit there. Mm. So the invitation, meditation is a very active process. It doesn't look like it because after all, you're just sitting there or may, maybe doing uh, uh, yoga where you have to be very mindful in, in doing the different asanas, the different postures of yoga, or doing walking meditation, um, it appears that you're doing essentially nothing. But what's happening is you're training your mind to focus. Our minds are all over the place. In fact, out of a Harvard research study, we learn that about 47% of our waking hours, we are not in the present moment. Mm. We are either in the past, maybe ruminating, we're all pretty good at ruminating, or we're off in the future, planning or worrying or whatever, and we miss the present moment. In one of my first trainings, as I sat under John Kabat-Zinn's teaching, he said to us, we have only moments to live. And it startled me. I thought, what does he know that I don't know? And do we need to get out of this building? But he was saying, be here now. These are the only moments that we have to be alive. These moments, these breaths. So the invitation of meditation practice is where we train ourselves to be more mindful because we're training the mind to pay attention to the present moment. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a wonderful schematic in a research study done some years ago in, uh, in the UK by a researcher, Peter Malinowski. Uh, he explores the neural mechanisms that are associated with meditation practice and, and maps out the different areas of the brain that are active as we sit mm -hmm. in meditation. Meditation. So we sit, say we're focusing on the breath as the meditation practice, and we focus on the breath, breathing in, breathing out, noticing where the in-breath finishes and the out-breath begins, and we're actually activating particular areas of the brain. So the meditator will sit, focus on the breath, and before they notice, they're off thinking about something else. Another area of the brain gets activated. And then the meditator recognizes that they're no longer paying attention to the breath, and they refocus the attention, and then the mind wanders again. And that goes on for however long the meditation practice. It can be really frustrating. So, and that's very normal, you're saying. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. We call it monkey mind. Yes. And. Uh, it's this funny thing about, we're like, our minds are so busy. They're all over the place, like a bunch of monkeys running through from tree to tree in the jungle. 
But, you know, the, our distant relatives share something in common. Chatter, chatter, chatter. So our meditation practice doesn't shut the mind off, but it does turn the volume down. Mm -hmm. And this, I would assume, is a skill that the more you do it like anything, the better you become. Is that, is that Absolutely. Act right? It's like going to the mental gym. So you want to do it for more than a couple minutes a week. Think about going to the gym. Well, I'm just going to lift weights for a couple minutes, and maybe I'll come back later in the week. Well, good luck getting stronger. Um, same thing with our meditation practice. The more we practice, the better we get at it. And here's where the non-judging fits in, too, because... I can't do this. I can't stay focused. Um, so I guess I'm not going to be very good at it. Or maybe I'm not breathing right. And I hear it often. And to those folks, I say, well, first of all, let me say it's normal. And second of all, let's just look at um, doing it over and over. So I used to work with chronic pain patients. For them, their pain is a dominant thing in their lives. Um, so we use a lot of meditation with folks and just saying, yes, the pain is there, but let's redirect your attention. So we direct the attention away from the pain to the breath. And we might use guided imagery or just simply staying focused on the breath. And they notice that the mind goes back to the well, of course. So each time that they notice that the attention goes back to their pain, we invite. We don't force. We just invite your attention back to the breath. So we start out with small meditations. Sometimes we'll say, let's use a doorknob meditation. The next time you go through the door, you put your hand on the door and pause and take a breath. Breathe in intentionally, breathe out intentionally, and then go through the door. You've done a doorknob meditation simply by focusing your attention in the moment on the breath. And then let it grow from there. Grow it to three minutes. Grow it to five minutes. Research tells us that if we meditate daily for about 10 minutes, we're going to create changes in our brain mm. and how the different networks talk to each other in our brain. Fascinating. Where does gratitude play into this? Because that's something I've been trying to practice lately is bringing more and more gratitude to my mind and, and expressing it, not only internally, but externally to people. Is that part of this practice? Absolutely. Absolutely. There are meditations focusing on gratitude. Uh, different meditation practices activate different areas of the brain. Uh, what comes to mind with your question is a practice called loving kindness mm. meditation, which may surprise you, usually starts with yourself. We're our own worst enemies. We're our own critics. Nobody can criticize me better than I can. Um, and so in loving kindness, using four simple messages, affirmations, um, starting with yourself and then moving to someone that you have uh, a close relationship. We might call that person a benefactor someone who um, how you have this uh, deep connection with, and then moving to someone else that, that um, you have a loving relationship, and then moving to someone that you have a neutral relationship, and then moving to someone that you have a difficult relationship with, and then expanding that meditation out you can even extend it out to the stars, to the entire universe. But simple affirmations, starting with yourself, 
May I be happy. May I be free from inner and outer harm. May I be healthy in body, mind, and spirit. May I live in peace with ease of well-being. Those are four affirmations that I commonly use. There are many others, and of course the internet offers a truckload. Also apps like Headspace, yes. uh, Insight Timer are a couple popular ones. But there are a lot of, YouTube has tons mm -hmm. of things, and going to the different Center for Mindfulness at UMass, Center for Mindfulness at University of California, San Diego, uh, streaming meditation practices, and of course there are many more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But and the experts like a Deepak Chopra. Oh, wow, yes, yes. I love to listen to his yeah. messages. Yes, yes. The Dalai Lama. Yes. Um, Sharon Salzberg is another favorite of mine. She was one of the, um, the co-founders of Insight Meditation Society. And this brings up another interesting point, Roger. Because oftentimes people think that meditation is a religious practice. It's a human practice. Our capacity to be present in our own good company is something that we all own as human beings. And to be able to touch into that. Uh, getting back to your point about gratitude, I am grateful for this day. I am grateful for this breath. But these statements trigger, stimulate areas of your brain. That's so fascinating. That's so fascinating how we can actually encourage the communication among the neural networks of our brain simply by how we use mindfulness and meditation practice. What do we say to those that do judge this as a practice? Or do we not say anything at all, you know, for, for, for the naysayers? Um, or for the person who's just struggling with, and, and good point about the religion, because I think a lot of people think that as well, but what if they're just struggling with that's hocus pocus. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we still hear it. We say, oh, mindfulness, it's just a buzzword. Well, go ahead, try it. Try a little meditation and see what happens. Um, and say, I hear what you're saying. I hear how, that you think it's hocus pocus. And I respect that that's how you feel. Notice we're back to the I statements. Yes. And we're back to honoring that person's experience. And once upon a time, I felt like that, mm -hmm. if that's a true statement for you. And here's what I have found as I have meditated over time. What's interesting, uh, tons of examples uh, out of my work with students at the university, at Binghamton University, we notice if we're meditating regularly for at least 10 minutes a day, and this is my encouragement homework for them. Uh, I say, please meditate for at least 10 minutes a day, and, uh, and let's see what happens. Long about four weeks, those who are meditating regularly come in with unusual, not unusual really, statements like, um, you know, I was, I was studying for an exam the other day, and my friend said, what on earth has gotten into you? You are not freaking out. You always freak out. What is different? And can you show me how to do that? And the student came in and said, I, I don't know what it is. Do you think it could have anything to do with my meditation? <laughs> And I said, well, yes, yes. That's great. And another student who says, um, you know, 
I have this great friend, but we get into arguments a lot. This particular time, we got into an argument. He started calling me all these names. Now, this student had been meditating for about eight weeks at this point. And he said, we got into an argument the other day, and he started calling me names. And instead of yelling back at him, which I typically do, I just looked at him, and I realized I don't like the way he's treating me, so I'm not going to treat him like this. And I turned and walked away. And that's new for me. What do you think that's about? It's remarkable. It is. And it brings us to that other point about mindfulness and meditation practice. Because when we are doing our own practice, we're becoming more self-aware. So we're able to self-regulate our emotions, handling stress. And there's a whole, again, neurophysiology of stress reactivity. When our meditation practice comes, becomes a regular part of our lives, we find that we're able to manage our stress better because of how the prefrontal cortex up here in the brain communicates with that emotional trigger back in the reptilian brain. And it just calms things down. And that, that leads to my next question that I wanted to ask you, because I've been practicing this for the last couple of years. And what I've noticed is, okay, it started out 10 minutes a day, 15 minutes a day. Now I feel, and I just want to see if I'm sane or not, I feel like the entire day is a meditation, almost. Like, not that I'm in that state, but that my mind is now trained better to react to emotion or not react, whatever, you know, much different than I used to. So I feel like it's always with me versus just in the beginning, it was that 10 minutes of, of calm. Yes. Is that normal? Absolutely. Absolutely. And you nailed it, really. Your meditation practice is with you always mm. because you're able to touch in, to self-regulate. You're seeing more clearly, with greater accuracy, with less judgment, because you're more grounded, because you're more aware. My guess is that this affects your communication with everybody around you because there's this whole intrapersonal practice of mindfulness, paying attention to what's arising, emotions, body, thoughts, and it automatically moves out into interpersonal awareness. And I should add that, of course, there's still many moments where I'll go back to some old ways with a reaction, say, to the kids. Mm -hmm. But then something new that I'm doing is that I'll go and apologize to them because now I'm aware of, you know, reacting that I, I shouldn't have reacted like that. But now I'm able to go back. So I think it helps them to see that I recognize it and then they're able to recognize their mistakes and hopefully do the same with, with their interactions. Exactly. Exactly. And you're able to touch in, oh, wow, I really fired off. The fact that you can go and you're teaching. You're teaching. You're absolutely teaching. Here's dad. He got angry. And now here's dad recognizing that and coming and apologizing and encouraging them to, to check in with their own feelings and to honor those feelings you're so human we all do this mm -hmm. we all do this uh, another great teacher uh, revered by many Pema Chodron uh, I was inspired she's written many books but one of her most inspiring statements was my mind still wanders even after all these years <laughs> of meditation I wanted to email her and say, thank you, thank you. But yes, Even we're, the you best bet. Best of the best, yes. You bet. Yeah, yeah. And fascinating 
we could teach this to the real little people. They're teaching this. I got a phone call from my grandson the other day. Oh, my gosh. He called, my grandkids call me Mimi. And so here's a phone call, and he says, Mimi, my teacher at school is teaching us mindfulness. I'm wondering if you could come and do something, just talk in our class someday about mindfulness. What a privilege. What a privilege. And, of course, I felt, and this is me dipping in and feeling, the emotion, where that emotion, which I will name gratitude, resonates in my body. And it starts in my heart and then just pours through my body. So I thanked my grandson. I thanked, and I said, please thank your teacher for this opportunity to share. Now my grandson is 10. He has seven-year-old triplets, sisters who when they were three years old, and this gets to the point of teaching young people to focus their attention in the present moment non-judgmentally. Uh, I had charge of the, the girls one night when we sent our son and daughter-in-law out for a date. We said, please go, we've got this covered. And the three-year-olds, typically of three-year-olds, began to miss mommy and daddy, and they began to cry. And how am I going to console these little ones? And I said, well, let's read a book. They love to read books. And so we read uh, another good resource for kids, and there are many, Moody Cow Meditates. Hmm. And we read about how a little boy, when he becomes angry, turns into Moody Cow, and his sister taunts him. Moody cow, moody cow. Michael is a moody cow. And so he goes off, moody cow, goes off to visit grandfather cow who teaches him how to meditate, how to regulate his emotions and calm himself. So we read the book together and then I offered listening to our breath. And one of the girls said, doesn't make a noise. You can't hear your breath. And I said, well, let's listen. Three-year-olds missing mommy and daddy took a few breaths with me. And as we sat there, let's take a deep breath, breathing in and out. And they said, you can hear your breath. That was their first meditation. Beautiful. Sitting Still Like a Frog, another great book for kids and their parents with uh, wonderful little meditations. Um, great tools to work with from early on to old, however old we want to be. How about for the teenage years, those tough yeah. hormone years and I don't want to meditate. Right? What advice would you have? Oh, golly. To say, I hear what you're saying. I see your anger and I respect it. I don't have to like it. But let's look at how you're working with these feelings. And they, they get frustrated by their own feelings, as we all do. Good to normalize those feelings. Another great resource is Dan Siegel, who is a child psychiatrist at uh, UCLA. Teaches and writes extensively on interpersonal neurobiology. Fascinating. And he has a great tool called Name It to Tame It. Working with kids, um, I am so angry. Or, or um, another tough one for kids is um, pure, uh, the whole pure annoyance. You know, we can just really be so unkind. And um, so just saying, can you name the emotion that 
you feel. Let's just take a moment and talk to me about how you're feeling. By sitting together, you're honoring their experience just by the physical presence. We're relational beings, we humans. So tell me how you're feeling. Can you name how you're feeling? I am so angry. I am so angry. I just feel like my anger is, is consuming me. You're angry. Name it to tame it. Because what happens in the brain is by naming the emotion, you're activating an area, once again, in the left prefrontal cortex area, that releases a neurotransmitter that actually calms down that primitive part of the brain, we call the amygdala, and actually soothes it. So the neurotransmitter that is released in the, the left prefrontal cortex soothes hmm right amygdala and calms them down. By naming it. By naming it. Name it to tame it. And they can actually self-calm. Maybe a little less angry or maybe a lot less angry. Because what they have done is they've done, they've trained their brains. So every time we get angry, every time we get anxious, whatever the feeling, the emotion is, when we name it, we can tame and it's kind of nice because it rhymes. Yes. It's easier to remember. Yeah. Another great tool is stop. Think of a stop sign. Let those letters stand for stop. Take a breath. Observe what's going on in this moment. Observing non-judgmentally. And then proceed. How do I want to go from this point? And when we take that moment to step back, we're reframing what's going on. Example, somebody cut you off in traffic. Boy, how do you feel that? Yeah. And uh, so you can name the emotion. Stop. Take a breath. Boy, I'm really angry at that person who just cut me off. Now I could tailgate if I want to and just honk my horn and flash my lights. Or I could take care of myself and just say, that's their behavior, not mine. I'm going to choose something different. Just like Chris, the student who, instead of getting in, into an argument with his friend, stepped back and said, I'm not going not to participate in this. He was able to self-calm, and he was able to handle the situation differently. So, great point. And if we have friends or family or acquaintances that do react or overreact in those situations, is there anything we could do to help them, or do is it something that they need to just learn on their own? Well, first of all, they need to want to be helped. It starts there. If they're open to it, oh, golly, I wish I didn't react like this all the time. I'm glad you said that. So you wait for that opening yeah. before you say something. Well, you know, it's hard to preach to a congregation that doesn't want to hear you. <laughs> <laughs> and so we let them, and we're honoring once again, uh, and thinking how close that is to gratitude. You mentioned gratitude earlier. And honoring is so, it, it's akin to gratitude, I, it, at least as I understand it, because we're grateful that they have shared something. I honor how you're feeling. And you know what? I can relate to that. It's a normal feeling. When we normalize it, it, it lowers the temperature mm -hmm. and say, you know, I'm happy to share a tool that I use when this comes up for me. And it helps me to not react, but rather to respond to the situation. And that opens the door. Yeah, I wish you could teach me that, but... You know what? Does it stick? And you can talk about how we have to do it over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. We don't go to the gym just once. We go over and over and over. Hence the importance of the daily practice, that we expand. Sitting practice for 20, 30 minutes, using a, a guided, I'll say, um, 
insight timer or it's always nice too to just shut everything off and sit and focus on the breath and then the mind wanders and you refocus and over and over knowing that that is the meditation practice that that is the mindfulness practice and encouraging people to not be impatient with themselves we're all a work in progress we really are and, uh, and we're teachable and, until our last breath. Mm-hmm. Dan Siegel, once again, the psychiatrist, talks in one of his books about working with a gentleman in his 90s. Wow. We used to think that once the brain was finished developing in the mid-20s, as we used to say, how... Um, and, and then we just keep losing brain cells after that. It's like, we got to ditch that idea because it's not true. We have, and it's all this thing called neuroplasticity. We can uh, change these neural pathways throughout the lifespan. Does it matter what our age is? No, no. All that matters is that we're willing to pay attention to what's arising in body and the mind and the emotions in the present moment with an attitude of non-judgment. Look, and it, you know, this stuff is so important because you just, you know, naturally I think about things that I've said and still say about people that, oh, they'll never change, you know, at their age or whatever. But that, so I have to train myself not to do that anymore. Don't we all? Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> and moment by moment, and you're holding one of my favorite yes. books, Roger, Altered Traits, co-written by Dan Goleman and Richie Davidson, who've been buddies since the nine, uh, 70s. And um, Richard Davidson has, um, his laboratory is in uh, Wisconsin, and tremendous researcher on uh, what, what's going on in our brains with meditation. Of course, he has a website with a lot of, a lot of teaching in there. But in this book we call Altered Traits, we move from the sitting practice of state mindfulness. So we're paying attention in the present moment as we meditate, state practice. It transitions over time into trait mindfulness. And this book is replete with one example after another. Very, very well founded in the research on what happens in the brain with meditation practice. Mm -hmm. So our sitting practice, and you referred to this earlier, and your own experience of meditation, how it has impacted your relationship, your awareness of yourself and your awareness and engagement with others, how it becomes, how the practice remembers itself. In the heat of the moment, um, when you have an argument with your children, as you used as an example, when Chris got into this very heated argument with his friend, His meditation practice remembered itself because of the changes in his brain. So he'd spent eight weeks training his mind to pay attention, to focus. Now it is translated into training his brain. It has become a state mindfulness practice. What you're experiencing as you continue in your own practice you're mindful throughout the day, I think was how you said. Yes. Yeah, it's a meditation practice throughout the day. Yeah. No, this, uh, I, I, would, I want to read this book, and thank you for bringing this. Okay. Science Reveals How Meditation Changes Your Mind, Brain, and Body. Yes. That's all we need. Yeah, that's <laughs> it. We humans. <laughs> so you like to talk about that it's so simple. Yes. But it's so Difficult. Oh, it is. It Can you is. bring that together for you us? You bet. How easy is it for you to bring your attention to your breath? Simple. Piece of cake. Mm-hmm. 
how easy is it for you to sustain your attention on your breath? Not so simple. <laughs> <laughs> it's simple. What could be easier than being aware of this breath? But to keep it there, right. to train the mind, to stay put, it's, it's that monkey mind again. And so we just keep training it over and over. I'll sit for meditation, and I've meditated for years. But before I know it, I'm off into what may or may not happen later in the day. Or perhaps a memory will pop up. Or some task that I wish I had done yesterday. Instantly, I'm off in the past or the future. I'm aware, and I come back to my breath. Over and over and as we practice it, it becomes easier over time. But it's, it's not easy. It's not easy. It's simple, but challenging, very challenging. And you also gave the example earlier of uh, the woman doctor, I believe it was, who, who also said this, right, that she has, she still struggles. Pema Chodron, <laughs> uh, a wonderful, wonderful a uh, Buddhist nun, uh, and just a phenomenal teacher uh, and writer, I have to say. I enjoy her books so much. Her teachings are so rich. Um, and yes, she acknowledges, as do the other great teachers, and there, there are many, these guys that wrote Altered Traits, John Kabat-Zinn, um, and uh, I could go through a laundry list of teachers that I've been, uh, appreciated personally. Uh, Florence Melio Meyer, who's been such a strong teacher for me. Uh, I, I appreciate how uh, the uh, compassionate embrace of the challenge of being human. This being human is a guest house, as the poet Rumi Every morning a new arrival, a depression, a madness, and so on. And he tells us that we should welcome them all because each is a guide from beyond. Mm -hmm. We have these human experiences throughout the lifespan. We are always learning. We are always growing. We could always take that opportunity to be present, moment by moment, breath by breath. Can we talk about fear? fear. And again, I'm just trying to use some examples so people could relate. And um, I guess I could use my mother as the prime example in my life that always fearful of everything, especially when it was had to do with us kids. Be careful. Don't, you know, don't do that. Or, you know, it, everything was fear-based. Um, so I guess two questions. How do we deal with fear for ourselves in managing that fear? Because now that I have children, I have yeah, children, I have... Um, you know, some fears for them, but I'm trying to manage that. And then how do we work with someone like a parent who has that fear-based, uh, I guess, mindset, for lack of a better word, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. when it has to do with the relationship? Sure. Fear is probably one of our oldest emotions. Um, we humans, in the early days, as hunters and gatherers, we had to watch out for the saber-toothed tiger that might be ready to attack us. So fear is a very old emotion. And, uh, and that little amygdala that I was talking about is the emotional sentinel back in the primitive, very reptilian brain. So we share that fear with other species. Um, and knowing how deeply rooted 
that is in us as humans, we can normalize it and say, yeah, fear is common to all humans. And so recognizing, once again, name it to tame it for ourselves. I feel fear. It's important, too, to recognize that emotions are passing. We are not our emotions. We experience emotions. And if we allow them to take over, they can. But we are not our emotions. We are much more than that. So you're saying when the emotion happens, acknowledge it, but then release it? Let it go. Mm. Let it go. And fear is a tough one because it has a tendency to hang on. I'm not going to let you go. And it's like, you know what? This is fear. I'm feeling fear. It is a normal human emotion. Now, when I say that to you, do you experience something in your body? When I tell you that when you experience fear, that it is normal to humans, and that it is something that will come in this moment, but pass, that you can let it go, that you can release it. Does that change anything for you physically? It does, but I've been practicing that now for a couple of years. So two years ago, it, it, I don't think I would have processed it the same, mm -hmm. because it was the first time I heard it. Yes. But now that I've been practicing it, yes, I, I, I do understand, and, and, and I've been doing it and living it, that, that fear comes in. I no longer hold on to it like I used to. But are you able to identify where in your body that resonates? Hmm. Here. I'm just trying to, you know, I'm trying to imagine it right now. Yes, yes. And can you describe that? It's yeah. that lump in the throat, that, you know, anxiety, the, yes. the, you know, just the emotion that's all built up right here. Yeah. Now breathe into that space. Take in a deep, relaxing breath. Release on. What happens when you do that, Roger? Feels good. Yeah. 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 So giving that gift to your fearful mother. Mom, <laughs> I see that you're feeling fearful. And, you know, it's very much like our thoughts. Our thoughts come and go. Our thoughts are nothing more than mental Mom, what in this moment is making you feel fear? And what, I'm, I'm worried about you going on this trip, Roger. I don't want anything to happen, say, as an example. Mom, I really appreciate that you feel that for me. And so I'd like to share with you something that I do when I feel fearful for my kids. You feel fearful? Of course, Mom. It's a normal human emotion. So you've normalized the experience. And now you're going to share a tool because she's curious, perhaps. She'd like to know what you're doing. Here's what I do. Whenever I feel fear, and Mom, sometimes I can really get afraid. Terrified. I can, I can say that to you. There are times when it just overwhelms me. So what I do, isn't that interesting? I'm doing it right now. Automatically, I'm taking a deep breath in, and I'm just going to let that feeling go as I breathe out through my mouth. Can we do that together, Mom? And um, I can't wait to try it. Share it with her. Yes. Share I've never done that, her. so that'll be, that'll yeah. be interesting. And when we share these tools with folks, just the simplicity of name it to tame it, 
And of course, we can back it up with scholarly research right. and say, when you just sit there, you're actually doing something really important for yourself because you're training your mind to focus. You'll end up being able to remember things better. You'll get better sleep. I mean, there's so many benefits of meditation practice. And we can give this to one another so simply. A three-year-old can do it. A 90-plus-year-old can do it because we're humans. Having these experiences of the thoughts that come and go, like leaves down a busy brook, emotions that arise and pass, and the capacity that we have to self-regulate and say, I see that you're fearful. Can we talk about it a little bit more? And I'll share what I do. Same thing with anxiety. They're closely akin. It resonates in the body. We recognize where in the body that's showing up. And we can breathe into that. And just breathe into it and release it on the out breath. Just let it go. It's an emotion that strong in the moment will dissipate. The more we practice this state mindfulness, the more it becomes a trait. And it seasons everything we do. You see it in your life and being able to meditate throughout the day. You bring that awareness to each moment of each day. It's a trait, Roger. You've developed a trait. Yeah, no, yeah. and I'm grateful for it. Absolutely. And I'm so grateful to be able to pass on all of this wonderful information and tools to, to others. Super. Um, we've talked about the self. We've talked about family. We've talked about little ones. What about in business? What do you recommend for mindfulness in business? Bringing yourself wholly to whatever you do is important. Thinking back to your scenario earlier of the uh, superior who comes in and, um, and has a, um, a heated conversation, shall we call it, with you, and it's uncomfortable, um, and, and noticing whatever the dynamic is. Communication is such a huge thing, uh, and various communications that we have. It's not just our words. Our words are actually about 7% of the communication. Think of it. Hmm. Body language takes the bulk of it. 55%, I think, something like that. And the remainder is, um, is tone. Hmm. Think of when somebody comes in and says, um, how was your day? Um, or they're typing, how was your day? You know, it's like, it's a different communication. How was your day? Wow. I'm not sure I want to answer that one. Right. <laughs> so as we engage with whatever we're doing in our own work, we think we can multitask. That is not true, by the way. We cannot multitask. The brain does not know how to do it. The brain will switch between tasks. And the more tasks you give it in the same moment, the more fractured its attention becomes. It would be much more beneficial to pay attention to one thing the project gets done more thoroughly, and you probably feel better about what you've accomplished. So noticing, bringing that mindfulness into the workplace, into what you're doing in your own space, where are my thoughts right now? Am I bringing all the stuff from home with me? Well, we do bring our baggage. So what's in my baggage today? What am I bringing into my work today? What of it can I let go of so that I can pay closer attention to what I'm doing in this moment? And then as we engage with others in the workplace, uh, using those tools of present moment awareness with them. Uh, someone recently said to me, 
I get really frustrated when I try to talk to my secretary. And um, she tells me that um, she can hear me while she's typing. How do I get her to stop typing and pay attention to me? Once again, going back to crucial conversations, start with heart. She may feel overloaded with what she's got today, but that's not my problem. My issue is getting to communicate together. So here's the crucial piece. And so uh, say, for example, I'm the, the person who's asking my secretary to, to pay attention. And she's typing away and saying, go ahead, fire away, I'm listening. And I can say, I'm uncomfortable continuing to try to share what I want to get across while you're typing. Would you please stop typing? And so various tools with that. And then noticing when we do it to ourselves. You know, here I'm typing and I'm trying to answer the phone. And, and how, how can I have a meaningful conversation yeah. when I'm engaged over here? Yeah. Knowing that we can't multitask effectively might be a good place to begin with. Definitely. I'm glad you brought that up because that, um, that's another example of something I thought I used to be able to do. Now that I'm aware of it, I know I can't multitask. I can't. I don't know if anyone can. No, really. you, we can only really focus on one thing at a time and do it wholeheartedly and you know, with, with a full attention. Yes. When you try to multitask, here's another piece of it. Uh, as a short mindfulness practice, notice what's coming up in the body when you're trying to multitask. When you have the phone call right, and you're typing something. Anxiety. And, yes. Yes. So we're able to alleviate that by just practicing one thing at a time. Stop. Stop. Take a breath. Stop. Observe. Proceed. Yeah. I'm going to ask this person if I can call them back later. Or I'm going to say, you know, I really want to talk with you, but now is not a good time. Mm -hmm. May I call you in five minutes or an hour or whatever is appropriate for you? You're, you're honoring yourself in that too, in that you're setting boundaries. Boundaries are important, but you're mindful of what you need. And you're mindful of what this person needs. And you're honoring both. Sometimes it feels like you're juggling many balls mm -hmm. in the air. It often is like that when we have high-stress jobs. Yeah. But learning to work with it is key. So there was another example I wanted to ask you about, and that is, okay, so my lifestyle is my work. So people will say to me, I don't know how you do it all. You have a full-time job. You have a family. You do this podcast. You write. You know, how do you do it all? And I, when I'm asked that question, I feel, um, I guess I feel, um, mm. I don't have the right word. Let it surface for you. Yeah. From your body. Let your body give you the word. I guess I do this a lot where I feel that I need to compensate or overcompensate mm. for any goodness that I'm doing for myself. Mm. So I'll downplay it. Mm -hmm. So I'll either downplay it or I'll brush it off and, you know, change the subject or make a joke or whatnot, where in reality, my life is busy because that's the way I want it. Mm -hmm. I don't want to watch TV. I don't want to relax. <laughs> I don't necessarily want to do that. But I do, you know, early in the mornings, I, that's my time and I may do a little reading or meditating or whatever. But when I start my day to I end my day, I'm busy. But I, you know, I almost feel like I have to make an excuse for myself. Ah. So 
that's, that's what I was trying to get out is how do I get past that? And, 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 I'm, and I'm saying this again. I'm trying to think about our, our viewers and listeners that may be feeling the same, that we have to make an excuse for who we are. There's your narrative. I feel like I have to make an excuse for my lifestyle. I feel like I have to, so there's the emotion, there's the narrative, the mind, and just check in with yourself in this moment. Where is that resonating in your body, Roger? Just check in for yourself, because you're dipping in right now. That's that mm -hmm. practice we mentioned earlier. Right. And noticing, I feel like I have to make an excuse for lifestyle I enjoy? Is that accurate? Yes. Okay. Where does that show up in your body? <laughs> you're, you're putting me on the spot. <laughs> I, um, again, I just feel it here. And it's not that same fear lump, but it's I guess I get anxious just thinking about it. Yeah. So you've named it anxious. Mm. You've named it. So there's this thing going on in your brain, your gamma amino butyric acid being released from the left prefrontal cortex, soothing the right amygdala. That's going on right now because you've named it. It's in there. But let's look at the judging. I feel like I have to, so there's a little bit of judgment in there, yes? Yes. Perhaps. And correct me if I'm inaccurate on any of this. So you know what that feels like in your body, and you've identified the narrative. You've identified the emotions. Let's use the stop sign. Stop. Take a breath. We're observing deeply what's going on because all of your mind, body, emotions proceed. Let's proceed in a different way. Same scenario. People come to you, Roger, you've got all of this going on. How do you do it? It gives me joy. <laughs> Yeah, that's, I mean, I was thinking because I love it. You know, it gives me joy. You're right. How does that resonate? Oh, it's wonderful. What happens to? It's gone. Yeah, yeah. You so have, it's something, it could be that simple. Absolutely. All you've done is reframed the situation. You've moved yourself in essence from being the actor on the stage, feeling the angst, feeling the responsibility to somehow justify uh, your lifestyle to other, who cares? But here you are, you're on the stage, and, and so all of this is coming at you. But what you have done in this moment, by simply saying, it gives me joy. You've moved yourself from the actor on the stage to the observer in the audience who says, what a great show. You've re-perceived, you've reframed the identical situation. But look at what it's done for you physically. It gives me joy. You've done something in your brain. You've done something for your mind. You've done something for your body. And your body, in gratitude, let's it go. What does joy feel like in your body? There's no better emotion. <laughs> yeah. You give yourself joy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. You've given a lot of value here today. Thank you. Thank it's you. It's such a pleasure to share this. And I'd love to know, and I'd love for people to know, a little bit about you. We talked a lot about 
emotion. We talked a lot about meditation. Um, but let's talk about you. What, what are some of the things that you're working on or what's next for you in, in your career? Wow. Um, hard to say. I, uh, I, I enjoy sharing mindfulness. I've been at the university. I've worked with uh, various businesses in the community, uh, working individually with people, working with groups specific to, for example, chronic pain. Uh, what gives me joy is being able to share mindfulness and the ease of applying mindfulness practices, the ease of learning to meditate, the uh, understanding that we're all breathing right. A lot of times people say, I don't know if I'm breathing right. I say, well, sure you are. Good color. Um, I think you're doing just fine. And you've been doing this all your life. So relax into it. Um, for me, being able to coach people, uh, when, you know, oftentimes it just comes up, um, oh, you know, in the moment, and say, well, here's, here's an interesting little tool, and I'll share it. Um, doing small groups, one-on-one, -on -one, we'll see where it goes. Life is a journey. And, you know, a lot of times people connect, any, you know, I've noticed with myself that, you know, you kind of form your tribe of, of people that you connect with. Sure. Not everyone's going to connect with me, but there's certain people that do. Same with you. If there's people listening or watching that have feel like they have a connection with you, can they reach out to you, even sure. if they're afar? Oh, sure. The internet is a wonderful yes. thing. Um, so it doesn't have to be in person, that your, your, your work? No. Okay. An email, um, I don't have a phone, and I'm not on Facebook. Uh, I'm really kind of a private person. But, but we and, could share your email for them. Sure. If they want to reach you. Okay. Sure, Great. absolutely. And I'm Great. happy to connect with people that way. Uh, locally here in Binghamton, sometimes we put uh, groups together. Um, not a lot of planning, but certainly the interest to talk about, uh, for example, a topic. How do we apply mindfulness to fear, to anxiety, to communication, to our work, to family, to self? It begins here. Awareness starts with self-awareness, which we grow through meditation and mindfulness. And then it just automatically, just because we're humans, trickles out into relationships. So groups like that, if folks are interested, sure, let's do it. And what I'd love to do, if you're willing, is maybe we could host a workshop together here oh, where I'm you offer it to a group of folks that that are local and want to come in. Oh, that would be awesome. It would be fun. Yeah. I'll wait to hear from you. Great. <laughs> Rachel, thank you so much. My pleasure. Uh, this has been wonderful. One last question before I let you go, and I ask every guest this because I'm curious, and at some point I'm going to put a book together of all these answers, and that is, what do you want your legacy to be? Oh, of oh, being helpful. That the work I do would be helpful to others. That's what gives me the greatest joy, knowing that what I have to offer is of benefit. And that they, whoever I help, uh, turns around and, and gives it away. Here's what helped me. Maybe it'll work for you. It's worked since the beginning. Our greatest teachers are the wisdom teachers, the Buddha, uh, the teachings of Jesus, uh, and once again, all the wisdom traditions, not just these two that I mentioned, but from the beginning of humanness. Yeah. Wonderful. Rachel Leonard, welcome to the American Real Family. Thank you so what much for sitting pleasure. down. Thank you. And I can't you. wait to share your story. Thank you so much, Roger.
Thanks for tuning into American Real. Be sure to visit our website, AmericanReal.tv, or search for us on iTunes or YouTube for past episodes. While you're there, please rate us or leave us a review, as that helps others find our show. I am truly grateful and appreciate all of your support. If you'd like to be part of our inner circle or want one-on-one coaching, check out the American Real Learning Academy, where we have self-help groups and courses so you can build the best you. We also have a new Facebook group where you can connect with high achievers from around the world. If you want to go even further, maybe you're determined to write your own book or launch your own podcast, contact me today to see if we could help. You can reach me through Instagram or Facebook or email me directly at roger at americanreal.tv. And speaking of podcasting, our next course will be starting soon. So if you're interested in launching your own podcast, join me and podcast your passion. I'll take you through my eight-week course where I'll mentor you to build a world-class podcast. I'm only taking on a small group of people who want to share their passion through broadcasting, where I'll have you up on iTunes and YouTube within weeks so you can podcast your passion. Click on the link below for more information.